Let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And um, once you get there, as you do, join me in a word of prayer as we ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord, we come before you this morning as a church, as a young, vibrant, but yet strong church, Lord. And we ask that as we open up your word, that you teach us, you speak to us, so that, again, we'll grow stronger, that we'll have these things down as we get bigger. Um, Lord, we, we want to honor you as a body, Lord, as a group of believers. We want to glorify you with everything that we do as a church, Lord. Lord, so right now I ask that you pour your spirit, your Holy Spirit upon this room so that we may hear from you. Or so that we may understand the need for church discipline, the need to purge out those bad apples that are trying to cause division or cause problems here in the church, Lord. Lord, help us open our eyes and ears pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. The kind of sexual immorality that's not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your con congregation the one who did this? Even though I am absent in the body, I am present in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus. Hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens a whole batch of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may, you may be a new unleavened batch, as indeed you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old leaven, or with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In these first eight verses, Paul begins to address one of the sins that has infected the church at Corinth, the sin of sexual immorality. And he does this by stating the problem, giving them the solution, and illustrating what must be done to prevent immoral behavior. In verses 1 to 3, we see that Paul states the problem. Back um, in chapter 1, verse 11, Paul had gotten a report from Chloe's household of the divisions that were occurring within the church. Here now, it appears that Chloe's household has also reported another serious issue that has captured Paul's attention, sexual or immoral sexual behavior. Sexual immorality here is the translated Greek word pornea, the most general of all terms of sexual sin. Now, in the New Testament, pornea um, was, was just referred to as going to prostitutes. However, the Jewish community regularly used the word to refer to any sexual behavior outside of a marriage between one man and a woman. In this context, however, it's clear that the, sin, that the sin is a matter of incest. It appears that some guy had a sec, was having a sexual relationship with his stepmother, which violated the Old Testament law according to Leviticus 18.18 18 and Deuteronomy 22.30. Despite how sexually progressive the Greco-Roman world was, this kind of behavior, this kind of sexual sin was known, but it wasn't condoned in that, ancient, in that ancient world. The church's reaction to this affair was as bad or worse 
than the affair itself. Instead of grieving, being heartbroken over this sin, they were actually smug about it. They were smug over their newfound, enlightened tolerance. They should have been grieving about this, this sin, this behavior. They should have been mourning about what was going on here, and they should have removed this man from their congregation. And just as a side note, that no mention is made of removing the, women, the woman probably indicates and, and suggests that she probably wasn't a church member. She wasn't a, a church member to begin with. He then tells them in verse 3 that although physically absent, he is spiritually with them in thought and prayer, as well as in pronouncing judgment on this whole entire situation, which may have been something that, uh, again, he, they, he, they were aware of, but they just didn't acknowledge. So what he does in this letter, in this particular portion of the letter, is that he's, it, it's designed to confirm to them this judgment that he's going to pronounce, that he pronounces. In verses 4 and 5, Paul gives them so the solution to the problem. Paul declared that the assembled corporate body was capable of judging the offender in the name of the Lord. Now, why is that? Because he, as an apostle, has already rendered his legal decision as though he was present. So he tells him in the beginning of verse 5 that the offender must be handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, there's been a lot of commentaries, a lot of stuff out there that have misinterpreted what he is saying here. Some have said that Paul is speaking of the physical death of this man, to let him go so that he can die of whatever sexual disease that is, that's infected him. Some have said, you know, just you know, hand him over to you know, the, Ro the Romans so that they can kill him. But this isn't what he's talking about here. I, I, I believe and I agree with most scholars who say that Paul here is referring to putting him outside the church into the world, which is the devil's domain. If the person is a true believer, banishment to Satan's domain would cause misery and possibly repentance. At the end of verse 5, Paul expressed the hope express hope for the guilty with the guilty person's ultimate restoration and there he says so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord see the goal of, of, of discipline is clear the salvation not the destruction of his spirit and must be carried out with an attitude of restoration not condemnation Paul also wrote this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take note of that person. Don't associate with him, so that he may be ashamed. Yet don't consider him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. In verses 6 through 8, Paul informs them how they can prevent the problem from reoccurring. He starts off, though, by telling them that their boasting for this individual sin is harmful. It's harmful because one person's sin leads to tolerating everybody else's sin. You allow one person to, you accept one person's sinful behavior, then it's going to be okay to allow another person's sinful behavior. And all of a sudden, it's just an open, the, the floodgates will open will open in the church as far as immoral behavior, sinful behavior. To illustrate this, he uses an image they would all be familiar with, leavened bread. One of the requirements during the Passover, during the Passover supper, was that no yeast, or in other words, leaven, be found anywhere in or around the Jewish home. It was, to be, it was to be left alone outside. And even the bread of the feast was to be unleavened. And that's why when we, when, if you guys have been part of a Seder, 
um, there is no real bread with yeast in it. It just looks like crackers because there's no, no yeast in it at all. Leaven is a picture of sin. It's, it is small but powerful. It works secretly. It puffs up the dough. It spreads. The sinning church member in Corinth was like this piece of yeast. He was defiling the entire loaf of bread, or in other words, he was defiling the entire congregation. It was like a cancer in the body that needed to be removed by drastic surgery. Thinking of the Passover reminds Paul of Christ as our perfect sacrifice. Jesus' atonement was not intended to free us to sin, but to liberate us from sin. Paul thus calls his audience to act according to the way God had already chosen to consider them in Christ. This means putting away all forms of malice and evil and behaving in ways that genuinely conform to God's true standards. So to prevent these kinds of problems from reoccurring and to keep the local church as pure as possible, sin must be purged from the church. The sin of sexual immorality is a problem that still plagues many churches today. I'm sure most of you have either read, seen, or heard how ministries and families have been devastated because of it. In fact, uh, just recently, I'm not sure if you guys heard about it, but the president of the Southern Baptist Convention had to step down for moral indiscretion. Now again, the details aren't said, and we really shouldn't um, really know the details, but the fact that he had to step down tells us that you know this was a pretty serious issue. It happens. It happens still to this, to this day. Speaking on this topic, I once heard a pastor tell a group of ministry leaders, and this is more so, I guess this can be directed to men and, and women, but he, he said, don't allow two minutes of pleasure destroy 20 years of ministry. It's just not worth it. It's too heartbreaking. Now I want to take a moment to point out exactly how sexual sin negatively affects the local church and the person or the people involved in it. Let me begin by explaining how sexual sin harms the local church. First of all, it will damage the reputation of the church. If a church is to remain a bright beacon of morality, then it mustn't allow anything to blot out the brilliant light radiating from it. Nothing on earth is more valuable to God than his church. You see, he paid the highest price for it, and he wants it protected, especially from the devastating damage that is caused by division and sexual immorality. See, the Bible describes the church as a virgin bride of Christ. So as members of his bride, even as small as Fresh Vision churches, she is, she is to remain pure, holy, undefiled, until the groom comes back, comes back for her. Secondly, it will damage the unity of the church. When sin enters the church, discord often follows, and discord leads to division. A perfect example of this can be seen by looking at how much the church has been divided because of the issue of homosexual marriage. The Bible is clear that God created marriage to be between one man and one woman. Yet just like the Corinthians, certain leaders in churches today are not only condoning it, condoning that behavior, but are also boasting about it. Now, I've heard the arguments and, you know, that about love and, and, and this or that, but 
this may have been the case between this man and his stepmother. Oh, you know, we shouldn't do anything. We should leave them alone. They really love each other. Each other. They care about each other. You know, and again, the Corinthian church were boasting about it. And what's happening today is that, you know, a lot of churches are ignoring this issue with gay marriage. You know, um, it is grievous. It does grieve God because it's not what he intended when he created man and woman, when he created marriage. We need, and it's important that when something is wrong, that it be called out as such and not make excuses for it. And especially not boast about it. As a church that holds the word of God in the highest regard, every leader that serves here will seek to maintain the, ch the church's unity through moral integrity. We will not compromise or bow down to the pressures of the outside world. We will not conform to the forces um, uh, that have different standards than true biblical standards. The strength of our unity will be known by ensuring that that one bad apple doesn't spoil the bunch, which leads, which leads me to my third point. Thirdly, immoral behavior will weaken the church. And this begins from the top down. If the church is to remain strong, church leaders must have a higher standard of honesty, integrity, and moral behavior. If you want to know what's expected of us as leaders and how we ought to, and the kind of behavior or moral integrity we're supposed to have, I recommend leading the letters Paul, reading the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus. See, too many ministries have failed because of a leader's moral failure or a leader's, or the leaders of that church refusal to confront the sinful behavior of others. Therefore, moral integrity and fearlessness and fearlessness are important qualities a leader must have. The strength of this church is also dependent on believers who are a part of it. In Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, Paul wrote this, now as, now as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. In other words, you all have an important part of this church body. And the strength of this body depends on how strong each of you are in Christ. God alone provides the strength. And all you have to do, if you're in need of it, and if you're hungry for it, is just seek Him out. Ask for it. There's so many passages, you know, in the Bible that speak, Lord, you know, you are my strength, you are my rock. I will seek you continually. He must be sought out. If you just weak in a particular area, and all of us are, we have to just seek him out for strength. And as I said, the stronger we grow, the stronger you individually are, or you are as, as, as a Christian, as a believer in your obedience, in your faithfulness, the stronger this church will, will become. And we're gonna, and God is, I can just, I can't even imagine what the things God, the things God will do when just everyone is just, has that fire and everyone has that strength. I now want to explain how sexual sin harms the person or the people involved in it. It'll cause irreparable damage to families. Sexual sin has been one of the leading causes of families being torn apart. Sadly, the perpetrators fail to see the consequences of their actions until it's too late. And the families that they once cherished, the families that they once held dear, have been, are gone, is no longer there. 
Some of you may know families that have been through this. And it's, it's devastating. It's hard to, to, to see the pain and the hurt in the lives of those who were offended, whether it be the husband or the wife, and, and, and also the children. You know, children, when they, you know, the kids, when they find out, regardless of what age they are, when they find out that mom or dad, you know, committed some kind of sexual sin, and now family's gonna be broken up, I mean, it, it, it devastates them too. Because this man or this woman they saw as a hero, or maybe someone they saw as, you know, someone they looked up to is some, they've totally blown it, they've messed up. You know, and it's, it does, it causes, da it causes damage. I also know parents that have been heartbroken that because their children have decided to live a lifestyle that they know is biblically wrong. And again, maybe some of you guys know, you know, how, the, the grief of a parent and finding out that their child, their son or daughter, is just living a lifestyle that is morally wrong. If this is you, or if you know someone like this, I can only tell you to continue to pray for those children, for our children, your children, ceaselessly, ceaselessly. Keep in mind that God is hearing you. God does hear your prayers. He is not ignoring. I, you know, I've heard of so many uh, testimonies of children going off into the world and completely, you know, being that prodigal child. You know, and through all their experiences, all their mess, you know, living in the in the in the in the pigsty, you know they eventually recognize the life that they're living and they see, man, I completely blown it. And sooner or later they, they, they come back to the Lord. And we have to continue, just that's why we need to pray whenever we know of someone's children, our children, if they ever find themselves in a situation that they'll come back. And if they do, they're going to have a powerful witness. They're going to have a strong witness of what the Lord did in their lives. Just as many of you have, many of you have your own powerful witnesses. You know. Again, God is hearing you and has a plan and purpose for those children. Secondly, it'll hurt the ministries they lead or are involved in. Involved in. I already touched a little on this, but when someone is involved in sexual sin and it's found out about, the ministries they lead or were involved in is damaged. It's never the same. Yeah, it'll eventually recover, but it just, it'll never be the same. There's that dent that will always be there in that ministry. And Lastly, it'll lead to the loss of fellowship. When the loss of a close brother or sister is the result of sin and they've been excommunicated or they've been removed from the fellowship, it can be just as heartbreaking as death itself. I know because I've seen this happen to someone who I once considered a close brother, someone who I once, you know, I, I, I considered him my boy. You know, he was just a, a great guy. He was really strong for the Lord, taught the Bible in a powerful way. But secretly, there was sin going on in his life. Not just, you know, immoral sexual sin, but other sins as well. And no one knew about it. And Robin has... You know, come. You know, she's 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 right, and something she learned, you know, from the Bible is that eventually, everything comes out. Eventually, it all comes out, and sure enough, it did for this particular guy. 
because he had no idea the sin he was involved in. And when it was discovered, and when he was told not to come back to the church, it took me some time to recover. I was hurt. And, you know, I, I, I felt almost bad because I, I was blind to not see it myself. Either I was completely blind to it or he just hit it so well that, you know, I just I, I had no idea. But it was. It, it took some time for me to recover. But it was an important lesson that, that, that was learned. Sexual sin can't and shouldn't be ignored. The repercussions for doing so will be devastating for a church and the, pre and the people directly and indirectly involved. There's a little bit more here that he, he mentions and uh, I want to get to it before the time is over. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy or the swindler, swindlers or idolater, idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or, or verbally abusive, a drunkard and a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outsiders. Remove the evil person from among you. In these closing, closing verses, Paul seeks to clarify an apparent misunderstanding or possibly even deliberate misrepresentation of something he had told them in a previous letter. And he clarifies, first he clarifies what he did mean. In an unpreserved previous letter, Paul had mentioned that those in the church should avoid associating with immoral people. Unfortunately, though, it appears that they, again, they either misunderstood what he, was say, what he was trying to tell them, or even maybe some leaders were purposely misinterpreting mis, uh, his words. Whichever was the case, the Corinthians assumed, the Corinthian uh, church assumed he was referring to non-Christians who were to no one's surprise living in sin. So do you see that they, they, they thought that he was talking about, that what he was saying was, yeah, don't associate with anybody in the world. Don't have anything to do with them. And so that's what they were doing. They were living in, in a little bubble. You know, they weren't going out and, and being the salt and light that God called them to be. Avoiding unbelievers would, of course, be impossible you see, you would either, you would have to be either living in an island or living in a cave. There's no way. There's no way you can, I mean, I guess, if you think, I mean, I guess you can be creative and find ways to completely avoid unbelievers. But it's just, it's almost an impossible thing to do. We're, we're going to come in contact with somebody that doesn't believe. Warren Risby wrote this, Christians should not be isolated but separated. We cannot avoid contact with sinners, but we can avoid contamination by sinners. Paul then explains what he did mean. He clarifies that, he, that what he had meant in his previous letter was that they were to stay away from so-called be uh, believers who were immoral. And again, this is that that pornea word, one who engages in sexual immorality. Those who are greedy, these are those who have more and act unethically to, to get it. Or like they want to have more and act unethically, unethically to get it. An idolater, those who worship anything or anything above God. 
verbally abusive, those who say things to hurt or to malign others, a drunkard. This is someone, I guess, this was just of a big of an issue back in the ancient world as it is today. Or a swindler, those who cheat or extort others to obtain something. And so again, he's saying, you know, these brothers, these people who call them, who are so-called brothers and sisters, these are the ones that you need to stay away from, not associate with. So not only were Christians to remove from their fellowship people who repeatedly refuse to repent of their sins, he specifically states at the end of verse 11 that they must not even associate with them in intimate social gatherings outside the church. Not even a table meal, not even hanging out with them at McDonald's or a water burger. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's completely putting that person aside. Paul then ends with a convincing argument for the reasons to take action against unrepentant believers. Paul explains that because the church's jurisdiction is restricted to its own membership, they must be willing to judge sinning believers for these kinds of sins. However, the, the church must not judge and condemn those outside the church. This judgment is future, and God will take care of it. God will judge everyone in the world. It's not our place to go out there and start going out and condemning them and judging them and, you know. No, our role is just to share the love of Christ, to share the gospel. You know, and it's the Spirit, it's God who convicts a person of sin. You know, you, I'm sure you've seen people on TV going out there and saying some really awful and mean, th mean things out there. And, and, I, and I read verses like this, man, what are you guys doing? You know, it's not, that's not our job. God will judge those people. Again, we're supposed to take care of our own. We're supposed to, this small church fellowship, our local church here, we need to take care of what's happening here, what's happening within this body. So just to make sure there's no misunderstanding this time, Paul concludes with an unambiguous statement. Remove the evil person from among you. Notice here, though, that the singular noun, man, has been replaced with the plural, with the plural pronoun, them, suggesting that Paul is generalizing here. To call them to cast out from their lives anyone or anything that is notoriously and persistently wicked. Now, I, I, last week I mentioned some of the purposes for church discipline. Here, Paul tells us how church discipline is enforced, who it applies to, and the necessity for enforcing it. Christians who are part of a church body are not to associate with other believers who are being disciplined for immoral behavior. Now, you have to keep in mind that the removal of fellowship ought to be considered as the final course of action for a believer's unwillingness to repent. This, the, the excommunication, whatever you call it, removal of fellowship, it is the last and final step a church will take. You know, before, again, I, I, it, it's going to be the last step, essentially. All other measures will be used and exhausted. Counseling, you know, one-on-one -on -one counseling, discipling, you know, other, you know, other means or other ways. Wisdom and discernment must be applied. And sometimes advice from other leaders who have been through something similar may be needed. When a final decision has been made by church leaders, the offender, and this is, uh, and what I'm speaking about here is, is how we want to model church discipline. How we're, more than likely we're going to be doing it here. 
again, it all depends on the circumstance. It all depends on the situation. But this is what how we intend, how we're going to, or how we're going to, to, to exercise church discipline. When a final decision has been made by the church, by church leaders, the offender will meet with the leadership and will be informed of their removal without revealing the exact details. It will be the pastors or my responsibility to inform the church the reasons why that person has been removed and suggest the course of action. But, but we won't force this. If we say, you know what, we need to leave this person alone, we're not going to force that upon We're not going to say, you know, we're watching you. We're watching your text messages and your social media. We're following you to make sure that this person is being left alone. No, we're not going to do that. You know, we're only going to recommend the course of action and we will not force you in any way to stay away from the offender. We will leave that up to you to decide for yourself. We're going to leave that, you know, it's, it's your choice. If we tell you, hey, you know what, this, this person, we can't, this person, we, you know, we remove this person from the shell, from the fellowship, and it'd be best if you not associate with, with, uh, with them. Again, it's going to be up to you whether you want to listen or not. However, the church must trust that all steps have been taken to prevent the loss of fellowship from occurring. And again, all options have been exhausted. The point of removing someone from the fellowship of a church is for them to understand the severity of their sin and have a heart of humble brokenness. Now, depending on the circumstance and severity of the sin, a return of fellowship is possible, but not guaranteed. If he's hurt someone here in the church, or you know, again, sin is too grievous, you know, and he is broken or she is broken, then we will welcome them back into the fellowship. But we will say, hey, you know what? I, you know, it, it'd probably be best. Let us help you find another fellowship where you can be a part of. Again, we must protect those that are here, keep them safe, and think of them as well. Church discipline is designed for unrepentant Christians in sin and therefore doesn't, isn't applicable to unbelievers. There's someone out there who hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're unbelievers. They're, again, brand new Christians. They won't be removed from the fellowship, from this particular fellowship. Again, unless it appears that their motives are to purposely harm the church. If there's, they have secret motives um, behind why they're here. Who we're talking about, who we're talking about are those who have been in the church for a while, who know better and are willingly disobeying. Again, young Christians, unbelievers, they don't know any better. They, you know, again, we're, as older, more mature Christians, we're here to help them, to help them understand, to lead them to Christ, so they can see what the Bible has to say about a particular issue or problem. We would never say, you know what, you're automatically not doing what it says here, so you're out of here, you know. No, I mean, again, we must give grace, we must give love, we must be compassionate on those who are new in the faith, those who are here that are seeking, you know. The day may, I was having a conversation last week, they may come where there may be someone here who is living a different lifestyle, who is dressing differently than all of us. We ought to accept them and embrace them, you know, with, with love and compassion and grace. But again, if the, over time they're not growing and they just, you know, they want to continue to, to, to be in willful disobedience of what the Bible says, then eventually something will, will have to be said, something will have to be done. I don't think any of you would discipline a child 
for not knowing that they're stealing. None of you would spank a child for running in the freeway for not knowing they're not supposed to do that. No, you explain it to them. You tell them stealing is wrong. Running in the middle of the street is wrong. And after you've explained it in every way you possibly could, why stealing is wrong and why they shouldn't do this or that, and if, and if they continue to do it, then that's when eventually discipline has to come in. Enforcing church dis discipline is necessary, is necessary because it protects those who are new in the faith and reminds Christians in the church of the consequences for immoral behavior. One of the ways a person will learn about unacceptable behavior is when they see firsthand the consequences of disobedience. Now, this is something I learned not necessarily here in the church, but when I was in the Marine Corps. When I first went in, you know, there was, uh, we don't have necessarily like court like civilians do. We call, you know, we have what, they're what we call uh, NJPs, non judicial punishments. And what happens to that uh, military member, he has to stand, if it's public especially, he has to stand in front of his peers and um, his CO or, or his officer hands down the punishment for an infraction. And those kind of things are meant for us to see what will happen, the consequences for blowing it, completely messing up. Now in this particular case that I, that I witnessed, the Marine was completely unrepentant. He's just like, you know what, I don't care. I don't want to be here anymore. This sucks. I want to go home. And I remember seeing that officer after he dismissed that, that Marine just in tears. And he was talking to us and he was crying and saying, man, I don't, I don't get it. He went through boot camp. He went through all this and, and he made it this far. And all of a sudden, that's, that's it. He wants to give up. And so now as, as, a, as a leader and a pastor, we can apply this in the church. You know, we have to be, you know, it's, it'll happen. But, you know, if it does happen and we have to, it's, it's meant for us to see, you know what, it's, it's for their good and it's for the church's good that this discipline is happening. I hope and I pray, I sincerely do, that we never have to do this, that we never have to purposely get together, the leadership has to get together and, and say, hey, you know what, this person needs to be removed, we need to talk to this person and remove someone from the fellowship. I really hope it doesn't happen. But if the situation calls for it, as leaders, we will be prepared. We will, you know, the Bible tells us to do this. It needs to be done. And it needs to be done for the sake of the person involved in the immoral behavior and again for the protection of this church. As I mentioned in the beginning, this chapter serves as an excellent guide for church leaders to know when and how they must exercise discipline. Paul does a great job explaining why it's necessary to remove, to purge out that bad apple from the bunch and the potential dangers that can come from ignoring it. The goal of discipline, again, is clear, and I'll repeat this. The salvation, not the destruction of his spirit, and that it must be carried out with an attitude of restoration, not condemnation. This is God's intention, not just for the believer, but for the unbeliever as well. Restoration, not condemnation. If anyone desires to have that relationship with God, they must be, that sin must be purged from the life of the person. It must be completely taken out from a person's life. And the only way that can happen, the only way that sin can be purged is by coming to the cross and allowing Jesus Christ to take it all. What 
Jesus did on the cross. It means that we can now hand him all our sins. Our sins can be wiped away by just handing it over to him. Because that's what he died for. That's what he hung on the cross for. And he can forgive us. He can forgive you. If you're watching, listening, and if you're here and you've never done that, and you desire to completely surrender your life to the Lord, and you want to be seen as clean and righteous in the eyes of God, and all you got to do is just be born again. Allow Him to come into your life, into your heart, so that He can heal you, so that He can clean you, and so that, again, you can start seeing what He wants out of your life, so that you may live a life, so that, you, you know, you may start to live a life of obedience. Again, if that's you, if you've never done that, and you are ready to hand your life over to Christ and be born again, wherever you're at, in the quietness of your heart, just close your eyes and bow your head and just pray this prayer with all sincerity. Lord God, I know that I've sinned against you. I know that I've blown it. And I stand now before the cross and repent of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died for me. I confess he is Lord. And I ask Lord that you completely take all my sins and free me from sin and death. I accept the forgiveness that Jesus offer on the cross. And now fill me, Lord, with your spirit so that I may love you and praise you and glorify you all the days of my life. Give me the strength to follow you. Surround me with people that will show me, help me to show me who you are. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that, if this is something that you've sincerely prayed from your heart, let us, let somebody know, talk to somebody, and, you know, we'll, we'll lead you, we'll help guide you in the right direction, whether it's finding another church or, you know, or coming here, whatever it may be, we'll, we'll help you with that. But again, I know this is, for us that are here, this is one of those topics, again, that, you know, that is heavy, but at the same time, it's necessary for us to know and understand. Because if there is no discipline, then everything's just going to go crazy and wild, and it's not... God, we have a God of order, not disorder. And therefore, we need to understand these things, especially as a young church. You know, and if you, know, if you guys hear or know anything, I would prefer that you talk to that person or people before it reaches the leadership. Because, again, that's where it should be. It should, it should be amongst each other and, and keep each other accountable. Anyways, again, this going through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we're going to come across chapters like this that are really tough, but also necessary for us to teach. And again, reminders for those who are leading of what our responsibilities are. So with that, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time. I pray that those who are here, those who are listening and watching, may have learned again the importance of church discipline. May have learned that again that immoral sexual behavior will not be tolerated in your church, within the bride of Christ. 
Give us the strength as leaders, as members of this church, to be able to do something about it. To be able to counsel, to be able to advise, and if necessary, to remove that person, that believer, from fellowship. Lord, we need your wisdom and we need your strength to, to do these things, Lord. And so we ask that you pour your infinite wisdom upon us, Lord. Lord thank you for the example you've set for us. And we ask now that we grow stronger in you. Let us look to you for answers to everything. Bless this next time of fellowship, Lord. Bless everyone here. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy, Lord. Whatever is ailing them, heal them. Comfort them, Lord. May we be united always. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.